On behalf of the Interfaith Movement staff and board, we want to thank you for being with us tonight. We're going to begin this evening with two breaths and bows. We'd like to uh, ground ourselves this evening. Um, the first breath and bow this evening is to acknowledge and honor the ancestors of indigenous communities on whose land we sit. I'm on Chochenyo Ohlone land and many of you are scattered across California and maybe even beyond. So if you'd like to say the name um, in the chat or even to yourself silently, whose ancestors have been buried here and for whom since time immemorial, this has been their homeland. We commit ourselves to work together with their descendants for right relationship and self-determination. We also acknowledge this evening the ancestors who labored on this land under more than 300 cent three centuries of enslavement until emancipation. We acknowledge that there are many who labor still while incarcerated or under other forms of exploitation to whom our existence is tied. May we continue and pledge ourselves to work to abolish slavery and exploitation in all its forms and seek the repair of justice. Tonight is part two of our Radical King Prophetic Faith series. Somebody on mute, we could, we could mute everyone, thank you. Um, and we're using this time of the year, this holiday time of uh, the King holiday and Black History Month as a time to dig our feet in and to reground ourselves. We'll be looking tonight uh, at the sacred text of the letter from a Birmingham jail and treating it like a sacred text, studying it together, um, valuing it as something that comes from a particular time and context, but reading it and studying it today for insights into our own context. We also value the opportunity tonight to study together and to get to know one another across faith traditions, across race and ethnicities, and across geographies. And remind ourselves that the end goal of all of the work and campaigns and social justice work that we do, that the end goal is beloved community. So we hope tonight brings us one step closer towards that as well. Um, I wanna just, We're gonna be in conversation uh, later tonight and um, we're really starting this study time, study circle together this evening. And I wanted to ground us into, in some community accords or principles, some principles that help to guide our conversation that help us unlearn our other ways of relating to each other, maybe oppressive ways that are reproduced in our everyday society and unlearn those and to really to practice another way of being with one another in conversation and creating uh, a democratic um, and a humanizing space with one another. So some of these community principles, they're here uh, and I'm gonna go over them. They'll also be in the faith study guide, which will make accessible to all of you during this evening as well. So the first one is to speak in the first person and the I, to own your own personal wisdom um, and to, to, share, uh, to share your thoughts and not comment uh, about you, the others, but speak from your own perspective. The second is being conscious of the anti-Blackness and racial, gender, and other forms of inequality that are in the society and the air that we all live and breathe in. So we're all living in that context, so we want to be conscious of how that might show up in the ways we interact with one another. The third is to step up and step back to being conscious about how we share space with one another, share space in our small groups and share space in our time tonight, making space so that everyone has a chance to share. If we're very talkative, to make sure, check ourselves to step back, see who hasn't spoken and extend invitations for others to contribute. If we're um, more reserved to, to step up because there may be some important wisdom that you have to share we can all learn from. The fourth is to practice respect and breaking it down into the Latin, re, see, re and see, seeing again and again, people, 
or topics with a new lens. So re-seeing, some of you may have seen each other, you know, know each other from other contexts, but really being able to re-see each other because you have changed and so so has, has everyone else, as well as re-looking at a text or re-looking at a moment in history or looking at a topic again with new and fresh eyes. The fifth is to suspend judgment on others and on yourself. Six is to practice curiosity. If there's something you don't understand or maybe even don't initially agree with, to just practice curiosity and inquire, practice inquiry. What do you mean by that? Say more. The seventh is to say, ouch, if something is said that hurts. Um, sometimes, often we don't know when our words can hurt others. So saying ouch helps us all learn and um, uh, not just sweep it under the rug and not just go forward, but to really acknowledge that if there is pain. And then to receive feedback with an open heart. So we hope that tonight is a gift. Um, we're so grateful to have uh, our guest speakers tonight who are gonna help help open up conversation for us. We're gonna go into small groups of fours and fives. We have several facilitators who have, are, have been prepared. And if you'd like to access the study guide, it's on the bottom of each slide here, you can see this bit.ly faith study guide, it has the community cords on it, as well as everything on the slide. So when we go into small groups, you'll be able to look at that to see where we're at. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna try going into small groups and seeing how that works. This is a bit of an experiment to do a discussion group on Zoom with so many people. So we're gonna break into small groups for 10 minutes and um, you're gonna share your name, your gender preferred gender pronoun, um, from where are you joining us? Um, a passage that stood out to you from the text, or if you were able to read it or listen to it, or an emotion that it left it left for you. And some of you will have facilitators, and so facilitators, please identify yourself. And if you don't, um, we ask that you designate a facilitator and use use the guide at the Bitly Faith Study Guide to help guide your conversation. Okay. If there's any questions, put it in the chat. Um, we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, put you into small groups just as a way to get our first initial introductions out with each other. Hi, welcome back, everyone. Did it work? Did you have a good? Okay, great. Good, good. Um, we are going to move into our, um, our first reflection for tonight, and I'm going to introduce Reverend Dr. Larry Foy who's the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity's regional organizer in Los Angeles, and he leads our Justice Not Jails program. Um, he is a public theologian, a social ethicist, and community activist. As he shared with us in part one of the series, the nonviolent direct action campaigns of Dr. King stirred him as a young boy in rural Louisiana, inspiring him to be involved as a 14-year-old in desegregating his city and led him to commit his life to a path of justice. After some years in Chicago, he has spent the last 30 years in Los Angeles, where Reverend Foy is engaged in efforts to reshape the landscape of Los Angeles in terms of race relations, social justice, and advocated for monumental policy shifts to decarcerate California prisons in the last decade. Today, his work with the interfaith movement engages faith leaders and formerly incarcerated people to advocate for jail and policing reforms reinvestment in community solutions and finding ways to uplift the humanity of those incarcerated. I'd like to pass the mic to Reverend Foy. Uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Lee. Uh, and uh, good evening to all of you who have joined us uh, and um, who are going to engage in this uh, reading, this study, as uh, Reverend Lee mentioned, of what I believe uh, to be a sacred document. So I want to uh, start uh, my comments uh, by uh, basically giving a background and context of uh, for the uh, Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, and I think uh, the best way to do this is to actually uh, give you, uh, read to you uh, the letter that was uh, written to him. So if you would just invite me for me with me for a few moments, uh, and then uh, perhaps you would have give uh, gain even more insight in terms of King's uh, 
ultimately pen in his letter in response to uh, the letter from uh, the clergyman from uh, Alabama. So uh, here is the letter. The letter is dated to, uh, on April 12, 1963, and it reads as follows. We clergymen are among those who in January issued an appeal for law and order and common sense in dealing with racial problems in Alabama. We express understanding that honest convictions in racial matters could properly be pursued in the courts, but urge that decision of those courts should in the meantime be peacefully obeyed. Since that time, there has been some evidence of increased forbearance and willingness to face facts Responsible citizens have undertaken to work on various problems which cause racial friction and unrest in Birmingham. In Birmingham, recent public events have given indication that we all have opportunity for a new constructive and realistic approach to racial problems. However, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens, directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize that the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized, but we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. We agree rather with certain local Negro leadership, which has called for honest and open negotiation of racial issues in our area. And we believe that this kind of facing of issues can best be accomplished by citizens of our own metropolitan area, by the Negro meeting with their knowledge and experiences of the local situation. All of us need to face that responsibility and find proper channels for its accomplishment. Just as we formally pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political traditions. We also point out that such actions as incite the hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days with, when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. We commend the community as a whole and the local news media and law enforcement officials in particular on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public to continue to show restraint should the demonstrations continue and the law enforcement officials to remain calm and continue to protect our city from violence. We further strongly urge our Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. The letter is signed by eight clergymen representing uh, the eight major denominations uh, at that time uh, in the nation. So uh, the letter uh, was entitled a call, by the way, was entitled a call to unity. So here's Dr. King's response. Uh, well, yeah, basically his response from the letter. Uh, as noted, um, the letter from the clergy was published in the Birmingham newspaper on April 12, 1963. Uh, the same day that the letter was published, someone slipped a copy of the newspaper to Dr. King's, uh, to Dr. King on the door of his jail cell. King had been arrested for violating a state order which prohibited boycotts, marches, and public, any public demonstration in the city of Birmingham. The court order was directly and specifically against Dr. King, his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or known as the SCLC, and against the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, a local civil rights advocate and leader of the Alabama Christian movement, who, by the way, had invited King to Birmingham. But here's a more concise summary statement resulting in Dr. King's arrest, of the letter to him from the clergy, and ultimately his response. The Birmingham campaign uh, began on April 3rd, 1963, with coordinated marches and sit-ins against racism and racial segregation in Birmingham, Alabama. 
The nonviolent campaign was coordinated by the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, as I just mentioned, and Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. On April 10, the circuit court judge by the name of W.A. Jenkins issued a blanket injunction against parading, demonstrating, boycotting, trespassing, and picketing. Leaders of the campaign announced they would disobey the ruling. They did not want King, however, to be arrested because they had no money to bail him out. And more importantly, they needed him to be free to move the campaign forward, notwithstanding, uh, notwithstanding the court's uh, order. King decided that he would be arrested and that in so doing, it would demonstrate both his solidarity with the people and also that by going to jail, it would demonstrate his commitment to upholding moral law, which demands disavowing the laws of the nation, especially when such laws were rooted in, rooted in injustice. So on April 12th, King was arrested, along with SCLC activist Ralph Abernathy, the Alabama Christian movie Fred Shuttleworth, and other marchers, while thousands of African Americans dressed for Good Friday looked on. Now to the letter. Upon reading the letter from the clergy, Dr. King was outraged. He became so perturbed at the fact that the clergy did not only misunderstand and misrepresent the movement and the urgency of the moment for ending segregation in Birmingham and in the South, but that the clergy by appealing to the courts as a legal and proper means to advance the cause of blacks, as opposed to the campaign as opposed to the campaign's counteraction to boycotts, marches, and meddling, uh, according to the clergy, from outsiders, and that by their mere presence and protestations, uh, they undermined the law and order, which resulted in violence. King felt that the letter required a response from him. So on the same day, April 12, without paper and pen, King found a pencil and began to write his response on the margins of the newspaper column of the clergy's letter. When he ran out of space, he then used toilet paper and then scraps of paper provided to him by a black jail trustee. And finally, finally finishing the letter when his lawyer got permission to give, bring him a pen and a pad. King gave the letter to one of his uh, lawyers who smuggled the letter out to the Reverend Wyatt T. Walker who along with his secretary, Willie Pearl Mackey, meticulously pieced the letter together. And so although the letter was not officially published until two months later in June 1963, uh, in the June 1963 issue of the Liberation, followed by June 12th, uh, 1963 publication in the Christian Century, and then in June 24 edition of the New Leader, and then reprinted in 1963 in the August uh, issue of the Atlantic Monthly newspaper under the headline, The Negro is Your Brother. In the interim, the letter was widely shared and read among King's organizers and among the black citizens of Birmingham. Black clergy held meetings in their churches where they read the letter to their congregants and then engaged in ensuing discussions such as we are attempting to emulate uh, this evening. The letter immediately became a source of inspiration for King's followers and the Black citizenry of Birmingham, including Black children and youth. The letter, in fact, gave impetus to escalate the nonviolent campaign in Birmingham and to include in its strategic efforts the presence and participation of Black children and Black youth. King was released from jail on April 20th. Four days after the letter was released, his letter was released, and now King was emboldened to learn that it has infused and inspired his supporters to up the ante, if you will, and to include different strategy tactics to put more pressure on Birmingham city officials, elites, and business owners. He was particularly intrigued by an idea and proposition put forth by one of his field organizers, James Bevel who thought that including children in the protests and demonstration would mitigate harassment and violence from Bull Connor's police force. Bull Connor was the chief of Birmingham's police force at that time. 
On May 2nd, then, the Children's Crusade, referred by some, of, by some as the Children's March, took place in Birmingham. The crusade lasts from March 2nd through March, uh, May 2nd through uh, May 5th. Hundreds of children did not attend school on May 2nd. Many of them encouraged by their parents and some of them in defiance of their parents took through the streets to march. Overwhelmed by the large presence of these young black children, Will Connor, commissioned of the police department ordered and released an onslaught of police and police canines, firemen with fire hoses, and then brutally assaulted the children with billy clubs, vicious dog bites, and with water pressure from fire hoses with such force and power that it literally dislodged children and adults alike from their feet and from whatever means of stable support they cling to. The onslaught against Birmingham's black children was cast over the airways, reaching beyond our nation's shores. The naked brutality and horrific acts against the children, who though brutally attacked, arrested and jailed, did not deter their resolve, however. More children showed up the next day and the day thereafter singing in the midst of the assault upon their youthful black bodies, we shall overcome someday. Bull Connor's insidious actions against the children drew condemnation from President Kennedy and other world leaders and American citizens alike. Children's crusade was a turning point, not only in Birmingham, but in the civil rights movement and the nation's tolerance and otherwise indifference toward black Americans. Undoubtedly, here's my point. Dr. King's early arrest and his letter in response to the Alabama clergy call for unity and plea for blacks to forego joining and participating in King's protest methods, ironically, and with poetic justice, unify the blacks of Birmingham with King's supporters and infuse new energy into an otherwise fledgling movement. King's letter, though addressed as a response to the Alabama clergy, ultimately it reached the general public where precisely he believed the situation of black Americans would gain more favorable sentiment and the support needed for black equity, justice and freedom than that being meted out in the mock courts and quietly condoned by the white Christian community which failed to see the common humanity that they shared with black people. Since the original publication of the letter in June, 1963, as early as 1963, 1968, a group of clergy called for it to be included in the Bible with the letters of Paul. And as late as 2014, there are others who have called for the letter to be added to the biblical canon. Bruce Metzger, for instance, a prominent New Testament scholar, while observing that the letter is not likely to be included, no one religious, no religious or uh, no person religious or otherwise can dispute its authenticity, its prophetic edge, and that it speaks to the masses and ages both now and yet to come. My humble observation is that the letter to the Birmingham jail from a Birmingham jail is a living document. And furthermore, if the Bible was reopened to include modern day writings of religious thinkers, and Dr. King's letter from the Birmingham jail should be the first to be included. Now, there are principally four corresponding rhetorical focal points uh, King addresses in his letter. One, the claim that he is an outsider and therefore <clears throat> his presence in Birmingham is problematic. Second, that his actions are untimely. Third, that he is an extremist with no regard for the legal system and law and order, and four, that he bears direct responsibility for the eruption of violence in the city of Birmingham. Now, in a few moments, uh, my colleague, uh, Hilda Cruz and uh, longtime civil rights activist and retired pastor, Reverend Philip Lawson, uh, will uh, reflect upon uh, some of these issues we just outlined uh, the King attempted to respond to. But at this point, I just want to lift up uh, one reflection and I want to read uh, the passage from you uh, and I think you have it before you. Uh, and this passage basically has to do with King responding on the one hand to 
uh, him being an outsider. Uh, and also uh, a continuing passage, uh, passage will uh, demonstrate his response to uh, the campaign being untimely. So here's the passage. I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with a narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. And then King goes on to say that he is in Birmingham because injustice is in Birmingham. <laughs> and then to those who would say, by those uh, clergymen who argue uh, the King's uh, effort was untimely and that he should wait uh, and let uh, the courts work out this matter, King shares his own personal experience and the experience of black folk. And here, I want to read this to you. He says to the courts, never, we must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long, too long delayed is justice denied. And here he talks about the experience of black folk. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia, Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence. But we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darks of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers, at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advised, advertised on television. And you see tears swelling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children. And see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky. And see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are. And your last name becomes John and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you're harried by day and hunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments. When you are forever fighting the de degenerating sense of nobodyness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. And so with that uh, before you, uh, I want to, uh, I think we're going to move uh, into groups and we want to, you to reflect uh, upon uh, this prompt, this question, uh, and in light of uh, passages we just read. 
Here is the prompt for the question. What role can faith communities play in moving the nation toward racial equity and racial justice? What role can faith communities play in moving the nation toward racial equity and racial justice? That, let me introduce uh, Hilda Cruz. Hilda is our Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity's regional organizer in the Inland Empire, which includes San Bernardino and Riverside counties. Drawing from her valuable experience as an, uh, as an immigrant child from Mexico, a mother and a lay leader in the Catholic faith, Hilda's an outspoken advocate and seasoned community organizer. Focusing for decades on faith and social justice, she's a motivating force in both the English and Spanish speaking communities, building the leadership of faith leaders and spearheading our work in closing the Adelanto detention facility someday soon and an end to all immigration detention. So I'm gonna pass the mic over to Hilda. Thank you, Deb, and um, I just have to share with all of you how grateful I am that we get to collectively come together, reflect, and dialogue on this sacred text that is most relevant today. And I was just sharing with my small group how um, as uh, an immigrant child who was raised and went to public school here in the state, in the state of California, we were never taught about this letter, you know, these letters on how they um, develop. So um, as you now know, Martin Luther King sent these letters to faith leaders who were questioning and criticizing the demonstrations. Those direct actions um, as the black community sought the end of segregation. In the letter, he refers to segregation as a disease rooted in racism. As a faith leader that has led many nonviolent actions, this quote really resonates with me. Um, I don't know if you can put my quote. The quote says, um, one may well ask, how can you advocate breaking laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is not a law at all. And so um, this is um, a quote that really resonated with me in most specifically in issues of immigrant justice and racial justice, because I have seen that they're not as important or not important enough to be led by many of the churches that I have worked with. There has been much resistance that I get from mostly white faith leaders, as this, the, the, there's issues of laws that have been broken, right? They broke the law, so therefore they're criminals. And this is how they justify the punishment of incarceration that plagues mostly people of color at this time. And they also use Bible quotes aplenty one that I have seen a few times is Romans 13, 1, which says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. These last four years, we have seen many evangelicals justify a racist president that they believe as instituted by God which makes me question whose God they follow and how they have forgotten the Bible stories of resistance to unjust laws. One such story is the story of the midwives who saved the life of Moses. You know, um, so in the US we have a very long history of laws that have always served an economy that enslaves and oppresses people to make financial gain. We have a history that is rooted in racist practice of white supremacy, a practice that has dictated 
who can be seen as fully human and who really belongs. Laws that allow violence in our community through over-policing, that allows the use of force and controls bodies in jails, prisons, and immigrant detention centers to maintain white rule. And even caging children, just from what the same story that we heard from Reverend Foy, right? We use children to highlight the um, injustice of these laws, and yet we continue to brutalize them. We have lie laws that lead to devastating generational trauma on families and the breakdown of communities, all upheld by false claims of deterrence and preserving safety, all laws that reinforce public stigma. We also have had just laws that sought the common good. I remember one, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, which allowed me to change my immigration status and led to my naturalization as a US citizen. But the 1980s also gave way to a ton of unjust laws, like the war on drugs and the beginning of mass incarceration. And did you know that by the end of Trump's presidency, he had already made 1,058 changes to the immigration system? Changes like the Muslim ban, separation of children from parents, seeking asylum, asylum seekers being sent to immigration detention centers where they would be kept for months because there is a profit to be made. We also have unjust laws that continue punishing Immigrants are usually punished twice. If convicted of a crime, most likely they will be transferred to an immigration detention center after they serve their time in jail. And even if they have legal status, this will be taken away. And without the help of a good attorney, they face a third punishment called deportation. Just like the barriers that exist preventing formerly incarcerated persons to successfully reintegrate into society so that they would be able to find housing, employment, that they have the safety net needed, needed to thrive in our country, all of this is being taken away in the name of laws. So today I'm most grateful for the opportunity to collectively have these faith reflections and conversations that we need to continue having in our communities um, and to continue um, moving forth this movement. And so um, we're gonna be going back into our own small groups and we would like for you to share about some way that Allah has either criminalized or oppressed you, someone in your family or someone in your community. And um, we'll continue having these conversations. Thank you. Great. Um, it's getting, getting juicy here in the conversations. All right. Um, if you'd like to add anything in the chat that stood out for you, something to share from your small group, please feel free to do that. I'm going to introduce our next speaker. I know many of you are here tonight because you wanted, you missed seeing Reverend Phil Lawson on the Bay Area Circuit. Um, I'm going to find my introduction that I wrote. So Reverend Lawson, if we could spotlight Reverend Lawson, we're so glad that you could be here with us. This here. So Reverend Phil Lawson uh, is a contemporary of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, first introduced to Dr. King by his brother, James Lawson Jr., uh, who was a nonviolent direct action strategist for the civil rights freedom movement. Um, but, Dr. but Reverend Phil Lawson at the age of 15 himself signed himself up to be engaged in the justice and peace movements by joining the Fellowship of Reconciliation and studying nonviolent direct action. His first campaign was integrating the Methodist Youth Fellowship in Northern Ohio 
And then he went on to desegregate the city of Washington, D.C. with CORE under the leadership of Bayard Rustin. It was there at age 15 that was the first time that he went to jail being arrested at the lunch counter. He met Dr. King and deepened his engagement through his brother. And during the Korean War, Reverend Lawson was a conscientious objector and later served as an organizer with clergy and lady concerned for Vietnam. Over the years, he's mentored thousands of young people. I'm one of the people who consider him to be one of my mentors and feel so lucky. Um, and as a United Methodist minister in Kansas, Missouri, he created programs for black youth, including assisting them to form the chapter of the Black Panther Party and a welfare rights organization. Since coming to the San Francisco Bay Area over the past 30 some years, he's made a tremendous impact on social justice in the Bay Area. He's founded and provided leadership in many important organizations which are part of the landscape. The Oakland Community Bank of the Bay, East Bay Housing Organization, Interfaith Alliance, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Baji, and Faith Foundations and Interfaith Promoting the Healing of Societies, part of the San Francisco Foundation. He's one of the founders and early staff of the Interfaith Coalition for Immigrant Rights, which is one of the predecessor organizations of the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. And was also involved, I was also involved with him in Occupy Faith during the Occupy Movement. Um, basically at any rally in the last 30 years, he would be there. His powerful journey and legacy has been interfaith and multiracial and prophetic. And much of the te teaching of our methodology of faith root and organizing has been shaped by Reverend Lawson. Tonight, he's also joined by his spouse, Mrs. Joanne Lawson, who in her own right is a phenomenal organizer and justice advocate with the United Methodist Women and other organizations. So Reverend Lawson, I wanna pass the microphone to you. And I can, do you want me to pull up the quote? I'll pull it up here and you can either go from the quote or say whatever you'd like to share. Okay, go right ahead. I'm looking at the quote, oppressed people cannot remain oppressed. That's kind of tricky, you know, because uh, many a thousand million people have died in oppression, never being free. Uh, so it's kind of quick, kind of a, Kind a uh, quick. Maybe that's good. I see. I see myself. <laughs> Let me read the rest of it. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom and something without has reminded him that it can be gained. Dr. King's faith was um, just beyond sculpting. We must remember that there is a God and that God the, the mighty one name is let there be or and again let my people go that's the name of God so that uh, uh, action can for freedom and community building can happen spontaneously in the most on impressive places. Do you want to share a little bit about what we're you were sharing with me earlier about um, the enemy? The enemy is in me. Well, well, a large a, a part of the understanding of non nonviolent uh, direct action 
is a period of, of looking into into your, yourself, uh, you know, understanding that the enemy means and in me is the enemy uh, in my own hesitation in my own lack of call of courage in my own laziness and looking at uh, and, and seeing what the possibilities my my own inability to dream and imagine a new arrangement of life so the enemy is in me. In a me. I, I was very fortunate to live at a particular time, late 30s, 40s, as a, a young man when there was a just a uh, plethora of of uh, men and women working on issues of human rights and freedom and food, uh, anti-war uh, movement, the peace movement. And so I was nurtured by a great many people mainly my family, my father, my grandfather, who, in, who escaped from slavery, ended up in Canada where my father was born. My mother came from Jamaica as a servant and met my father at my father's church in Pennsylvania, and the rest is history. Before we get to, go ahead. Hello, I was about to ask you, is there something else you wanted to touch on? How about the opposite of slavery? Oh, the, the opposite, opposite of slavery, the opposite of sin is community. The, we, we tend to make the mistake as we grow up to thinking that when we become men and women, we are free, we have freedom, and we do have freedom to make decisions. But the, 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 what we forget is that in, into our very being is the understanding that without community, we, I, have no identity. When a young infant is born, the young infant has no sense of I am, but then a mother holds the infant, puts the infants on this breast and feels the pulse of another's heart, another feeds the infant and holds the infant and keeps the infant dry. And sooner the infant receives a message, I am somebody, I am worthwhile. Without the community, our infant would never receive the message I am. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, came to memory for me with, 
regard to Dr. King and his teachings is he came to our local church, Easter Hill in Richmond, back in um, the 60s, I think it was, yes. And uh, while he was here, he, he moved around the community. And um, I heard him talk about um, what the church should be doing, what the church should be doing in terms of the racial injustice that was going on in our communities. And so I guess that's the question that we could look at is what action can the interfaith community take mm -hmm. what, what 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 did he say to easter hill at that time <laughs> well he told us we had to come out of those four walls and um, get out into the community do some outreach um, write some letters make some phone calls he, uh, he, he was having us do the sort of basic uh, community organizing. Mm -hmm. And um, the question that I was trying to remember that he asked us was, what should the church be doing to build God's community? Mm -hmm. What should the church be doing to build God's community? What actions should we be taking hmm. back then and right now? Mm -hmm. you, you, you must remember that Dr. King is a son of the church. I'm a son of the church. Joanne's a daughter of the church. Many of us are children who grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. The, Lawson, go ahead. Uh, uh, the, uh, one of the images that I want to set forth, Deborah, is the image that the world is like a large drum. a large drum and you you touch it anywhere it vibrates all over the question is are you in tune with or sensitive enough to feel the vibrations of the drum when it's 3000 miles away. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to just leave people with the last uh, prompt. I, I think we could go with Mrs. Lawson's, which was very similar to the first one we had too. What's, what should the faith communities, churches, synagogues, temples, spiritual communities be doing um, to build the, the beloved community to build the beloved community and then reverend lawson you you gave you gave us this prompt too i don't know if you want to say anything about it but if we get to where we're going where will we be if i become yep. who i'm becoming who will i be whose will i be that's Who's right the, the the way we travel has a lot to do with who we will be when we reach at the destination. Hmm. So we have to travel the way we want to become at the end. Thank you. That's the power of Dr. King and the nonviolent spirit and direct action. I want to thank you both for joining us, Reverend Lawson, Mrs. Lawson.
We're gonna go to our last group. It'll be a little shorter this time. Um, so we'll leave you with a last prompt and a chance to say goodbye to, to, to your study group. Thank you, we're just about finished. We just wanna uh, have some final slides and I'm gonna ask, uh, invite Miriam Noriega, who's Interfaith Movement's program director to just walk you through this. Hi everyone, thank you again for joining. We want to give you a little snapshot of what our work is going to be looking moving forward. If you see on these slides, these are three um, campaigns that our, our organization is working through all the amazing staff. Reimagining public safety and community of care, which really invites the people of faith to envision what community can look like and how we can shift our perspective of what authentic public safety can be. And specifically with policies, you know, federal advocacy to reform criminal justice and immigration that is inclusive, compassionate, and corrects past harms. And we will also be doing a lot of advocacy on the state level about decarceration, private prisons and detention centers, protecting from deportation, and community of care, making sure that each of us can really put our role to collectively help one another and people find alternatives to, um, to incarceration and thrive together. So can, and then if you want to contribute to our work, there is the donation link on the bottom so we can continue to move forward together these campaigns. And I want to invite you to a very specific one that's coming up. You go to the next slide. Um, and that is a freedom campaign we are starting. We invite you all to harness that power of our faith to support Mario's freedom campaign, which means to advocate for his release from Adelanto's immigration detention center. Uh, Mario uh, arrived to the US from El Salvador when he was four years old and his family lives in San Bernardino. Uh, Mario, along with his children and his elderly parents have waited too long to be reunited and for him to care for them. Mario has beautiful gifts. He is a Christian minister who has theology studies. He's earned a GED in water treatment. All he needs is to be freed. He is in detention because when he was leaving prison, he was notified that there was an ice hold and he was taken to Adelanto detention facility without even being notified. And he's been there for almost three years and deserves freedom. So our staff freedom campaign coordinator, Maria Guadalupe, is working closely with his lawyer to create strategies to advocate for his release. And he needs all of us together. So we ask you to be in solidarity with Mario on Wednesday, February 17 at 11. Mario will prepare a faith reflection about Ash Wednesday, the first day of Christian Lent season. And this event will be broadcasted live on our Facebook page. And on that day, we will give you specific instructions on how you can call the ICE field director to advocate for his release. Um, there's more information and more about his story on the toolkit. The link is on the web, on the PowerPoint as well. So if you want to know more about Mario and keep up to date of what we're going to be doing on the strategies, you can do there. So thank you for your support and we hope you can join us on that day. I'd like to invite uh, Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb, who's the chair of our board to close this evening in prayer. Thank you. I'd like to um, begin this prayer uh, in Hebrew and end in Hebrew in, uh, to honor my tradition. Martin Luther King quoted the prophets and this is the verse he quoted in the letter from the Birmingham jail. The Yigal Kamaim Mishpat Utsdaka Knachal Etan 
May justice roll like mighty waters and righteousness like a sustained stream of life. Spirit of life, as we have been taught, the time is always right to do what is right. Spirit of life, may we understand our faith as accountability that is uplifted by our prayer together. Spirit of life, honor those who came before us, who lost their lives, who remained oppressed because the time had not yet come. May we be that time. May we open the waters and pass through. Spirit of life, may we heed the call. When rabbis asked King, what should we do? He said, get your own communities to come out. This was his message to come out to center justice and equity and the voices of those who are harmed. May we be where injustice is like the prophets. May we truly work to redeem all those who are incarcerated and to free all prisoners. Baruch atah Adonai hamatir asurim Blessed is the spirit of life that redeems the incarcerated. So may it be. Amen. 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 Thank you all for coming, being part of this evening, enriching our discussion, sharing in the facilitation, and for um, Reverend Foy, Reverend Lawson, Mrs. Lawson, Hilda Cruz. Thank you for your reflections. Good night, everyone.